Uh, can you guys please confirm if I'm visible and audible to you? Okay. Okay, great. Okay, I guess we can begin. Uh, the recording is in progress. Great. All right, so uh, this is an orientation session for the Advanced Audit and Assurance paper. So we will be, I will be giving you a brief introduction as to what this paper is all about, first of all, and then we can move on to uh, the syllabus aspect and we'll be discussing a few further aspects such as the exam structure, time and location, as well as how to prepare for the exam, how to prepare for your upcoming exam, as well as, uh, you know, uh, the overall uh, strategy for the upcoming uh, June session as well. Okay, folks, so first of all, let's begin by uh, understanding what the Advanced Audit and Assurance paper is all about. Now, the, uh, the AAA paper is basically the advanced version of its predecessor, which is the Advanced Audit and Assurance, sorry, the Audit and Assurance or AA paper from the skill level. And more and about that, if I'm looking, if I'm looking at the syllabus content, I would say that it's around 60% of what you may have learned in SBR or strategic business leader exam and 20% of the new uh, audit and assurance related stuff. And the rest of the 20% is basically uh, what you may have already learned in the AA paper as well. So that's basically just what the uh, AAA paper consists of. Some advanced topic plus uh, the uh, it does have some accounting aspect to it as well. <clears throat> now, moving on. Let's first of all uh, discuss as to what the syllabus is all about. So when we talk about the syllabus of AAA, first of all, we have part A, which is the regulatory environment. And this is where we first of all learn, uh, I would say first of all not learn, but uh, first of all, revise the basic concepts of audit and assurance. And we will also be looking at some of the laws and regulation, which regulates the audit profession as well. And then we move on to part B. Now, uh, in part B, we learn a, a familiar topic, which we may have looked at in other professional level subjects, such as SBR as well, which is the professional and ethical consideration, which consists of the uh, ethical code of conduct and the principles of ethics and stuff like that. Okay, folks, such as self-interest threat, self-review threat, et cetera. All those concepts are, uh, uh, are included in this particular section. And additionally, uh, there's also part C, which is quality management, which is a really, uh, you know, uh, really crucial term when it comes to the current uh, business scenario, because quality is something that auditors can uh, consider to be really relevant while conducting the overall audit process for a particular client. So uh, what are the standards which we have to adhere to in order to ensure that uh, auditors are providing their opinion or providing their or issuing their audit report with the utmost quality or conducting the audit work with the utmost quality. That's basically what we will be learning in part C, which is quality management. And then uh, after part A, B, and C, we will be starting to learn the overall audit process from the planning phase to its uh, to the reporting stage. Okay, folks, we will be learning about planning and conducting an historical, an audit of historical financial information. We will be looking at completion review and reporting where we will be, you know, part D and E are basically where we cover the entire audit process, including all the auditing standards, the ISA standards, ISQC standards, etc. And then after focusing on audit, we have a few certain new engagements that we will be focusing on as well in a part F, which is other assignments. Now, other assignments are basically some additional services that audit firms provide other than uh, the financial audit itself, which uh, which includes things like conducting due diligence review, uh, reviewing prospective financial information, uh, forensic audit, etc. All these things come under this particular part. And then we have part G, which is current issues and development, which is uh, which are some hot topics in the industry right now. We have to learn uh, we have to learn these aspects as well in order to, uh, you know, because there would be some current issue questions worth maybe uh, around six to eight marks, which can come up within the AAA paper. And after part G, we have part H, which contains the professional skills. And there's no uh, there's no theoretical content or anything that needs to be learned in, within this particular syllabus area. It's just the professional skills that you need to have while presenting your answer within the AAA exam. 
And this is what, something that's covered within our, uh, you know, revision boot camps when we practice a lot of exam standard question within the CBE environment as well. Speaking of the CBE environment, that's basically part I, which is employability and technology skills, where uh, where we discuss the basic uh, skills that we need to have in order to write the exam uh, in a CBE environment. That's basically all there is to it. Part H and I are just skills that you need to develop while practicing questions and while, uh, you know, uh, presenting your answer to the examiner. And that's basically covered when we, you know, practice questions ourselves, the exam status questions or past paper questions ourselves within the uh, revision bootcamp. Okay, folks. And for the rest of the syllabus area, these are all covered with, within our video lectures. Now, uh, moving on to the next aspect, that's basically all about the syllabus. If you have any sort of questions, feel free to shoot them in the chat box. I'll be happy to take them up. Uh, Moving on to the next uh, aspect, that is exam structure. So what is the exam structure all about? Let's have a look. So when we talk about the exam structure for Tripoli, it's a three hour and 15 minutes exam. And of course, uh, in order to take a conservative approach, I would assume it to be a three hour exam, okay folks? So uh, there's a time strategy which we will be discussing for this particular paper and in that, uh, 15 minutes can be considered as buffer time. Okay, folks, we will uh, we will be discussing as why we are taking it that way uh, a bit later, so don't worry about that. But uh, speaking about the exam structure as a whole, we have two sections, section A and B. And in section A, we have a 50 mark case study question. And then in section B, you will have two 25 mark questions as well. Now, uh, within the 50 mark question in section A, 40 marks out of the 50 marks is in relation to the technical marks, which is basically the marks that you earn by writing the content in your exam. And the rest of the 10 marks are professional marks and are dependent on the quality of points that you include and the structure in which you are uh, answering that as well. Okay, folks. So we will talk more about the professional skills and professional marks as well. So don't worry about that. Uh, so that's basically as to what section A consists of. And in section B, for each 25 mark question, we have 20 marks, which are technical marks, and the rest of the five marks out of the 25 is in relation to professional marks. Okay, folks, so these are, uh, this, can, this can be scored by demonstrating professional skills in various areas. That's, that's, that's basically the idea behind the overall exam structure. Just three questions, and uh, you know, there's a, it's just that there's a structure in which you have to answer them in the exam. And this is, of course, we, we will be practicing a lot of questions in order to you know, learn this particular aspect as well. So don't worry about that. Now, moving on. So let's talk about the professional skills, shall we? So what all professional skills needs to be uh, you know, demonstrated in our exam? And what are they exactly? Let's understand that, first of all. First of all, there's this communication skill which, which needs to be demonstrated, especially in the 50 mark question itself. And what is communication skill? Well, the scenario would be like this. Okay, folks, the 50 mark question will be in the planning stage of audit and your audit partner, audit engagement partner will provide you with some instructions as to what needs to be done. For example, they may ask you to evaluate audit risk, write procedures and stuff like that. So you just have to follow those instructions and reply to the audit partner in the form of a briefing report. Okay, folks, so there's a format in which you have to write that. You should provide the introductions and stuff like that, headings and subheadings, etc. So in order to, uh, when you present your answer in that manner, you'll get the uh, professional marks for communication skill. Okay, folks, so that's basically the first skill. And then there's the analysis and evaluation skill, which is kind of obvious, isn't it? You just have to evaluate and analyze the given information within your scenario and provide some really good points in your answer to get this particular professional marks. Then there's the professional skepticism and judgment, which is a really crucial uh, skill when it comes to this particular exam. Uh, professional skepticism and judgment is basically when you... <clears throat> When you, uh, you know, when you demonstrate a questioning mindset in the exam for certain scenario information that is being provided by the management or by the client, etc. Okay, folks. So that's basically the idea here. And you have to use your own judgment. For example, in areas like uh, when you determine materiality and stuff like that, which is a small calculation. Don't worry about it. Uh, and these are like the easy marks in the exam. Okay, folks. So that's basically the idea. 
And then there is commercial acumen as well. Okay, folks, so speaking about commercial acumen, sorry about that, one second. Speaking about commercial acumen, uh, we have we just have to demonstrate a, a commercial mindset in our answers. For example, if a particular requirement is asking you to write business risk in a particular scenario of, of a particular client, then you need to demonstrate the awareness of that particular client, what they do, their business model, et cetera. Okay, folks, that's how you get the marks in uh, this particular, for this particular skill. So that's basically all about the professional skills and how we uh, demonstrate it. Just to give you a basic idea, of course, we will be looking at it in detail when we practice questions and, you know, I will be, uh, you know, giving you some tips as to how exactly can you present it in a wonderful manner as well. Okay, folks, we don't worry about that. Now, uh, moving on to the next aspect, uh, aspect, which is the time allocation. So we have discussed the exam structure, but, uh, you know, uh, and, and we know that there is a 50 mark as well as 25 mark questions as well. But how much time should be allocated in order to write the answer here? That's basically something that we have to think about, isn't it? So uh, because, of course, for a AAA exam, time is a really... Uh, time management is kind of an issue for some students. So uh, let's understand as to what is the time strategy that we need to adopt, you know, to answering a 50 mark question as well as a 25 mark question. The reason why I'm telling you this at this point in time, or just when we are, you know, getting started with the course, is so that while practicing questions, uh, you would be able to practice practice time questions. Right, because when you practice time question, you would be able to understand as to whether you are able to finish it by the allocated time or not, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here. So let's understand this. So there's the ECC recommendation that is 1.8 minutes per mark, and uh, for each type of question, there's a different you know set of timeline that you could allow uh, you could allot. <clears throat> so. When I talk about timing of a particular question, let's say the 50 mark question, it's divided into two phases. There's the reading and planning phase as well as the writing phase as well. The reading and planning phase is where you read the requirement, first of all, which is the partner's email, the listing, except, sorry, the instructions, et cetera. And then you read through the entire scenario to understand the big picture, isn't it? And after that, you have to plan out what are the points. Okay, folks, what are some really good points that you can include in your answer to get both those technical marks as well as those professional marks as well? So that's basically what we do in the planning, reading and planning phase. And then we have the writing phase where you actually, you know, uh, put it into words. That's basically the idea here. Since we planned out everything, it's more efficient. It'll be more efficient to write it down as an answer. Simple as that. So for the 50 mark question, you need to take a total of <clears throat> an hour and 30 minutes. And out of that, 20 minutes should be allocated to reading and planning. And an hour and 10 minutes should be allocated to writing your answer or typing in your answer as well. Okay, folks, simple as that. And for the 25 mark, however, since we have less marks allotted, you can allocate around 10 minutes to read and plan the particular scenario, requirements, et cetera. And to write it down, you can take up to 35 minutes as well. Nothing more. Okay, folks, you can take less. That's more efficient. Great. Uh, if you can do that, that's great. But don't take more time than this. Okay, folks, that's something that I would say. Now, if you calculate the overall time, it will give you three hours, right? The rest of the time is, the rest of the 15 minutes is kept as buffer time, just in case you, you know, if, if you have to add on certain points to some, uh, or if you have le left out a particular requirement or, uh, you know, uh, you you didn't get an idea as to how to answer it, but uh, you know let's just focus on it on the last fifteen minutes, right? So that's basically why we we have the buffer time for. Okay, folks, we're just using the last fifteen minutes just to you know identify the instances where we uh, where we could score more. That's basically the idea there. Of course, uh, yeah, that's basically uh, how you should practice questions as well. Okay, folks, follow this time strategy. Just try to read and plan using 10 minutes for the 50 mark question and then an hour and 10 minutes to write it down. Okay, folks, so, and of course, maybe another 30 minutes to debrief as well. Okay, folks, so that's basically how you should uh, practice questions. And when I say practice, I don't mean read through the answers. That's not necessarily going to help us, isn't it? Because, you know, uh, even if we get the points that are stated in the answer, you know, uh, when we when we actually write it down, there could be a time management issue, okay, folks. So in order to become a bit more compatible 
with the time strategy or with the time strategy that would be there in the exam, we need to practice question in writing. Okay, folks, or type it in practically. Okay, folks, so that's basically the uh, uh, the idea regarding time allocation. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to ask that. Uh, uh, guess not. Okay, so uh, moving on to the next aspect. <clears throat> So how can we prepare for this exam or what are the requirements for preparing for a professional exam like uh, AAA? Let's understand that. <clears throat> it's basically a step-by-step -step process. First of all, there is, of course, learning the syllabus, which is kind of obvious, isn't it? Because we have to learn like 100% of the syllabus. So if you are someone who has already attempted this particular paper and you know couldn't make it uh, the previous setting, uh, you would understand that there would be uh, a few questions which could be expected, such as uh, the audit risk questions or procedures, substantive procedures. We don't know specifically as to what would be tested, but we do know that these kinds of questions can be tested. But, uh, you know, uh, the idea behind step one is that we have to learn 100% of it. We should not skip out on anything or we should not start try to question sport as well. What is question sporting? It's basically, you know, learning what is expected. That's basically the idea here. So uh, don't do that. Don't, don't try to, you know, predict what can come up in the exam and just learn that. Try to learn uh, the entire thing completely so that you can, you can get a better understanding as to what the paper is all about, what the, you know, advanced audit concepts are and get the benefit out of it. Okay, folks, so that's basically one thing. And of course, it's not just about learning it completely. It's also about understanding it and revising it on a continuous basis as well. Okay, folks? So after learning everything, just allot a few uh, hours or maybe even one hour per day just to revise through everything on a daily basis. Okay, folks? On a daily basis, not even weekly. On a daily basis till, your day, till the day of your exam so that you don't you know, forget or miss out on concepts. Okay, folks? That's something that I would highly advise. So that's basically step one. And the next step is kind of as equally important or even more important than step one itself. And that's basically to, uh, it's basically to practice, practice, and practice. <clears throat> so when I say practice, I mean practice questions and exam standard questions, of course, from, uh, you know, uh, the revision bootcamp, as well as uh, there's also other resources such as the Kaplan or BPP exam kits as well. You can just, you know, practice just one of them. That's that's totally fine. And of course, there's also the, uh, you know, step three, which is doing the question papers or past paper questions, which are available within the ACC's website as well. Okay, folks, there's a past paper library, as well as there's the CBE environment. The CBE environment will also have a few past papers as well. So just try to practice those as well. Those are really, really beneficial resources so that you can get some practice in. Because of course, all of us are not, or all of or every student who is attempting this particular, you know, AAA paper may not be experienced auditors, right? However, you could get some experience by practicing questions and dealing with different set of scenarios. Okay, folks. So the more you practice, the better. Okay, folks, that's basically something uh, really important. It's kind of equally important as learning the syllabus itself. And then there is step four, which is reading the examiner's report, because the examiner's report can convey what the examiner expects. Okay, folks, be it regarding the, uh, you know, uh, the points that are included, be it regarding the professional skills. The examiner's report can give you an idea as to what a strong candidate demonstrated treated in that in that particular exam setting, as well as what a poor candidate has done as well. Okay, folks, so that you can you know understand how you can improve your answers in the exam. Okay, folks, so that's a really crucial uh, resource that you could refer to as part of your preparation for the exam. <clears throat> and then there is step five, which is kind of essential as well, which is basically doing a mock exam. Okay, folks, so uh, conducting sorry doing a mock exam and getting valuable feedback on your answers is really crucial to identify the points in which you can improve yourself and to get some additional tips from your tutor as well. Okay, folks, so we do provide mock exam close to the, uh, you know, uh, for the June session, it would be in the month of May itself. So you could uh, get an idea as to where exactly you are, where exactly your current performance level is, and, you know, where is it expected to get? Okay, folks, so that's basically why it's really crucial to attend a mock exam before you attempt the actual exam. 
kifuxits, uh, it, it kind of increases your chances around 30% as well, kifuxits, if I have to give you a number. <clears throat> now, moving on to the final step, which is just to go write your exam. Okay, folks, so after, you know, completing till step five, you're actually completely prepared for the exam. And with some few last minute revisions and last minute preparations, you would be completely prepared for the actual exam. So this is just the requirement as to what you need to do for your upcoming exam. Of course, we will be getting into the planning aspect as well. Okay, folks? Now, let's have a look at that, shall we? So how exactly can you plan for your exam? Let's have a look at that. Now, to do that, we will have to have a look at the calendar. One second. <clears throat> All right, I'm sharing my screen in a moment. <clears throat> All right, uh, let me know if it's if an Excel is visible to you. Okay, great. <clears throat> All right, guys. So our date or the D date for us is basically June 5, isn't it? That's the objective. You may have a lot of long-term objective and stuff like that. But if I am to consider the short-term objective here, it's basically to clear the AAA exam, isn't it? Now, in order to clear the AAA exam, what do we have to do? We have to pass the June attempt. Now, in order to do that, what needs to be done? We've already discussed that. We need to learn the syllabus, practice question, and then uh, do the past paper, uh, past papers, as well as mock exam, et cetera, isn't it? So we just have to allocate that into a particular calendar, like prepare a calendar out of it, and then uh, <clears throat> and then follow that in a on a consistent basis. So planning and consistency is what we need to do in order to you know prepare well for the upcoming exam. So how should we plan it? Let's understand that, shall we? So our objective is to pass the exam on June 5th of 2023. And in order to do that, first of all, let's think from the objective, shall we? Uh, or let's think from the D-Day to the present. <clears throat> first of all, I have these days from the 1st of June to 4th, isn't it? And these are the days that I'll allocate myself for my final preparations. Okay, folks, and, you know, every individual has their own method of, you know, finally preparing for a particular exam, isn't it? Some may uh, do some revision, some may practice questions, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here. And uh, a few weeks before that, I may start, you know, practicing my past paper and then, you know, reviewing. I'll also try to read a lot of uh, examiner's report as well. Okay, folks, uh, and just to give you a heads up, the examiner's report from September 2022 is more relevant to you guys uh, since the professional skills were introduced during those from, the, from that particular exam setting. So you'll get a bit more idea as to how to write your answers perfectly from those, uh, you know, examiner's report as well. So try to at least read those as well. So yeah, just to give you a heads up. Now, coming back. So I've allocated days for my final preparation. And I'll allocate these days that I've highlighted in May for practicing the past paper, isn't it? Now, for the rest of the days, I have I need to do two things, isn't it? Oh, of course, there's one more thing, the mock exam. So let's say that I might do my mock exam on, uh, let's say, the 20th, just to, you know, give an example date. Of course, that's not the official date that will be communicated to you later. Don't worry about that. Now, before this, I need to finish practicing questions, isn't it, in my... Uh, revision bootcamp as well as in my exam kits as well, isn't it? So I'll allocate, let's say, these many days <clears throat> for that particular purpose. Not just in me, but, you know, since I have a lot of time, since I'm standing on, uh, you know, March, and since I do have a lot of time, uh, be it your working professional or a full-time student, uh, try to allocate the 
days for question practice as well as learning the syllabus in a proportionate manner. Okay, folks, according to your, you know, unavoidable circumstances like family emergencies or personal commitments as well. Okay, folks, so that's basically something uh, that I would suggest. So, yeah, uh, allocate the days accordingly. Like the remaining days should be allocated between learning the syllabus and practicing questions. If you could allocate more time to practicing questions, that's also recommended as well, because that's more, you know, important considering this is a professional exam. Uh, so, yeah. So let's say that I'll allocate these many days uh, practicing would take more time, especially if you are a working professional as well. So just to uh, give you an idea. So, yeah, uh, allo allocate these many days to practicing questions. And the remaining days can be used to learn the syllabus. What's the and by learning the syllabus, I don't just mean, you know, watch the uh, video, watching the video lectures itself, but because I do understand that some students may have their own methodology of learning as well. For example, even after watching the video lectures, you may have to revise through the content once again to understand it thoroughly as well, isn't it? So allocate the days accordingly. Okay, folks, so no one is expecting you to like learn the entire syllabus in a single day or uh, you know, in two or three days. Okay, folks, you have enough time uh, from this point, uh, point in time, of course, you have enough time to practice, uh, sorry, to learn the syllabus content and to practice questions for the unit time. So all I'm saying is try to practice, try to allocate the time efficiently and effectively follow them. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. So yeah, I'll allocate these days too. Uh, learning the syllabus as well. Okay, folks, so just like this, just prepare a calendar, right? Prepare a calendar. And it's not just about, you know, preparing the calendar and leaving it be, isn't it? It's also about, you know, following that plan as well, isn't it? So prepare the plan and follow it in a consistent manner and try to make progress as much as possible because, of course, uh, we're all humans. So uh, whenever some, you know, uncontrollable factor, unavoidable situation comes up, we get demotivated, we may not do you know, uh, much things as to as to what we may have expected. But, uh, you know, don't do that. For example, if let's say I have studied in, uh, for the first week, but in the second week, uh, I was busy on a Sunday, so couldn't do much. If that's the case, then, you know, don't get demotivated and do nothing for the entire week. Uh, just try to revise the plan once again. Uh, you know, try to do something on Sunday and try to, uh, you know, do, uh, try to make a little bit progress because if you do nothing, then there's zero progress, isn't it? There's, you're not moving forward, but if you're doing something, then that's a little bit of progress, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here. Just uh, plan it efficiently and try to consistently follow it as much as possible. If some, you know, uh, some unavoidable situation comes in, you know, try to, try to do, do something to make a progress. That's basically something that I would uh, advise as well. So in this manner, just prepare a calendar right after this call if you want to, and uh, and then you know follow it in a on a on a consistent manner. Try to follow it on a consistent manner. Now, a few additional things regarding the overall schedule. I would say, <clears throat> uh, it, it's regarding the number of questions that you can practice. I, I'm not a I'm not necessarily a you know an output oriented person. Sorry, an input oriented person here. As as in you know, I, I wouldn't tell I, I wouldn't tell you guys to allocate this much hours uh, or st study for this much hours per day, because, you know, I do understand that, you know, everyone has their own uh, methodology of studying and, uh, you know, they're all, they have their own method of, you know, grasping concepts as well. Some may take like uh, two hours to study a particular concept, whereas another person may take maybe, you know, one hour to learn the same concept. I do understand that. So, uh, you, you can you can take sufficient amount of time to learn the syllabus content, revise it continuously so that you don't forget. But when it comes to question practice, uh, you know, let's be a bit more output oriented there. As in, uh, you know, you have to like per day there should be a particular number of questions which you should have practiced. For example, if I'm taking a, uh, let's say I'm taking two categories of students here: a full time student as well as a working professional. If I'm talking about a 50 mark question, a full-time student could do maybe around three to four uh, 50 mark questions per day, per day, be it uh, for a full-time student, everything, every day is a, you know, a study uh, day, isn't it? So I would say, uh, you know, they can take the entire day to do four questions or three to four questions, I would say, uh, if I'm talking about a 50 mark question. For a 25 mark question, they could 
maybe uh, <clears throat> they could maybe do around uh, five to six 25 mark question per day for a full-time student. But for working professionals during weekdays, they may not have much time to allude. And considering we're all in this profession, the you know the, I do understand that there could be you know uh, students from uh, students working for a big four or working you know uh, nine to ten hour shifts as well. So uh, during a weekday, I would say you could either do one fifty mark question per day, or you can do. 225 mark questions. Okay, folks, try to do 225 mark questions or 150 mark questions on a weekday. I'm talking about the working professional. And uh, on a weekend, you can you know do, a, do it similar to the full-time students as well. Try to take up, uh, for working professionals especially, try to take up as much time as possible out of your daily schedule and devote it to learning. That's something that I would highly, highly advise as well. So yeah, just to uh, let you know. So that's basically an average figure. Of course, people who can do more can definitely do more. That's, that's totally, uh, you know, uh, I totally encourage that. But uh, this is like a, bare minimum. Okay, folks, don't go below that. That's something that I would advise. <clears throat> because we don't want a situation where it's the last week of May and we haven't gotten enough practice. Uh, we haven't practiced enough questions. Okay, folks, that can be... Uh, uh, there, are, there are two negative impacts due to that. One is that uh, in the actual exam, you may not get the right points at the right time. And secondly, uh, time management is the next issue. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. So plan everything and try to implement it in a uh, in a perfect manner. That's basically something that I would highly advise. Now, uh, moving on, going back to the slides, just give me a minute. All right, guys. So yeah, that's, that's basically all I wanted to cover. So uh, do you guys have any questions? Feel free to ask them in the chat box. <clears throat> or you can unmute yourself and ask them as well. Okay, moving on. All right, so uh, yeah, that's basically all I wanted to cover in this particular session. So uh, thank you for attending it. And if you have any questions, uh, then you know feel free to reach out to me uh, if you have already you know uh, uh, purchased a course with us, or uh, you know if you are interested in a course uh, with FinFram, then feel free to reach out to the contact number given in the slide over here, or visit our website fintram.com as well. Okay, folks. So yeah, thank you so much for attending, and I hope to see you in a few other live sessions as well. Okay, folks. Thank you. Thank you.